Okay, so you want to see a cool trick? Okay, it's not actually a cool trick. It's nerdy uh, PowerPoint stuff, but here we go. Ready? Cool. See what I did there? So what are we focusing on? We're talking about disabilities, but we're going to focus clearly, as you can see, with my nerdy PowerPoint trick on ability. So let's go ahead and get started. I can't talk about disability without just sharing a little bit of what I have learned about being a parent to an individual with a disability, because here is Mac, all two pounds, three and a half ounces of her. Please forgive me if I trip up on pronouns, my usual disclaimer. Um, Mac, if you listen to the infertility lecture that was optional, you didn't miss anything, so don't even worry about it. Um, Mac was actually one of identical twins, and I lost her twin brother when I was seven months pregnant, and I stayed pregnant with Mac for a few more weeks past that um, without delivering her twin brother. And so um, Mac was born in a fairly strong, for what she'd endured already, state, but still kind of precarious nonetheless. She was born 10 weeks early. And so um, she was in the hospital for, gosh, about seven weeks and, you know, had some complications from time to time, but really did very, very well, all things considered, being that she was such a preemie and even teensy tiny for um, being a twin born at 30 weeks. She was still really, really small for that. But what we realized, and by we, I actually mean both my parents, um, since they're in the medical field, about the time that Mac, it was right around like Christmas time, because I remember having Mac on my hip having her look at the Christmas tree at my mom's house, like Mac wasn't responding on her right side. And we didn't know if it was, because um, at this point she's only about five months old, if it was a visual impairment or a hearing impairment, but it wasn't clear yet. When Mac reached about 13 months old, 14 months old, after a whole bunch of kind of trying to figure out what was going on, she got the diagnosis of cerebral palsy. And so cerebral palsy, for those of you who don't know, you hear the word cerebral palsy, but I wouldn't even probably have known cerebral palsy until Max's diagnosis. It's an umbrella diagnosis for individuals who have experienced trauma either in utero or it like birth and infanthood. And so Max certainly probably did, being that Mac was in utero, and it sounds, you know, drastic, but it's true. Mac was in utero with a dead fetus for three weeks. And then Mac was born so early and um, her prematurity and everything, at some point her brain got impacted and quite honestly um, damaged in some ways. And so cerebral palsy is sometimes very, very mild. Sometimes it's physically um, a challenge, but intellectually a person is, you know, exceedingly capable and not impacted at all. Sometimes somebody has profound uh, physical and uh, intellectual disabilities, and it, it just runs the complete and total gamut. Oftentimes, actually, on college campuses, I will see students um, walking along, and I can see from their gait that they likely, because of the spasticity and the nature of it, because cerebral palsy oftentimes can impact you in various quadrants of your body. Like, for instance, Macintosh has um, right-sided hemiplegia. She has weakness on her right side. So you can see that spasticity in somebody's way that they hold their arm or the way that their walk is impacted. But again, they intellectually are as capable, if not more capable, than anybody could possibly be. And so that idea of it's, it's there's a tension in that. Because quite honestly, I would imagine that somebody who has cerebral palsy and it manifests physically but not intellectually, are, is probably because people have that physical like awareness of seeing somebody with a disability, they're probably going to be treated mistakenly like they have an intellectual disability from time to time. Whereas in Mac's case, Mac does have a physical disability. Um, she barely ever uses her right hand, but you don't really notice her, her cerebral palsy in her gait as much. And quite honestly, she compensates so well, you don't always really realize that she never uses her right hand. And so she presents without that physicality of a disability, but intellectually she is impacted. And so that can impact her norms and things like that. And so that's something really to think about much, much wider than Mac herself is just the challenge of kind of being respectful to people who have disabilities, but also kind of managing the norms about humanity in relation to a disability. 
as Mac has gone through her life, she actually at one point was enrolled in a uh, research study for Botox, like Botox for wrinkles in your face, because Botox can actually help paralyze some of the tendons that Mac um, needed to strength, like needed to par like help hold back some so that other tendons in her leg could actually strengthen and she could try to get her ankle down on the ground because she was up on her toes on her right leg for quite a while. Um, Mac at one point had surgery to actually rearrange tendons in her right leg and um, arm. And at that point, you can see the look on her face. It's so sad. Um, she was convinced she would never walk again. And so my mom brought out, like, when my mom brings out the little engine that could, that serious stuff. And you could see by the look on Mac's face, she wasn't buying it. She's had some seizures, a couple as an infant, and one notably when she was in eighth grade and scared the crap out of all of her classmates. Um, and so that has kind of been part of our lives with her cerebral palsy. And then she wore an AFO, so a leg brace, for years and was really excited at the orthopedic surgeon's office. That's actually him in the picture above um, when Mac was grown at about age 16 and she didn't have to wear the AFO at all. And then Mac, right? And so she does such a great job navigating through the world um, despite the kind of added challenges a disability can like can create. So, okay, a little bit more about disabilities. One in five people have them. They're actually the largest minority group in the United States. And it's a group that anybody can join at any time. So not that I would wish it upon anyone whatsoever by any means, but quite honestly, even though we are not driving very much, most of us a lot of times nowadays, but I could certainly just be driving to drop something off at my mom's house and be in a car accident and quite honestly have a disability for the rest of my life. Or, you know, my mom could have a stroke and be impacted and have a disability for the rest of her life. And again, please, you know, all the heavens that this wouldn't happen to, you know, my family or anybody else's. But it does happen. And so that's another way to kind of reframe disability is that there's a fluidity to the fact that you might not have one one day and you might have one the next day. Okay, so here is the bulk of what we will be doing together for the next few minutes. People first language. Now, I would love if you'd actually pause me right here, and there's a PDF um, in this particular module that says people first language. And what I want you to do is just, this would have been a PDF that I would have had you fill out together in class if we were together. Um, I'm pretty sure in every single lecture that I've done, I was like, if we were together, if we were together, <laughs> If we were together in person, you would have been given this uh, worksheet and you would all be staring at it because I would ask you to translate all of these top, all of these sentences into people first language. Now, a few of you, I usually have a student or two that have familiarity with people first language, but for the vast majority of you, you're like, wait, what? And so I'm going to give you this one example. And then what I'd ask you to do, and I mean, you can cheat. That's fine because I'm never going to know, but just pause me for a second and go look at it and spend like three minutes reading over them and see if after I give you this example, can you change any of those? It's not like you need to print it out or anything. Can you change any of those into people first language? So here's the example. This is actually, um, the sign is gone now, but this was a sign on the door, right next to the door at the post office around the corner from my house. And so you can see no dogs allowed except those assisting blind or deaf persons. And the reason you can actually see me on the left-hand side, I'm taking a picture of this sign. And the reason I did was like, oh my gosh, that's not people first language. And this would be a perfect example for class. Um, what's not people first language about this? And if you're going, I don't know what you're talking about. I understand. But you will. You will understand in a few minutes. Where is the word person at this in this statement? It's last, right? And so now you have described a person, a human being, with a myriad of ability as one factor in their life. You have described them as either blind or deaf, as this particular sign says. Now, granted, you would have to you would have to pay for a bigger sign to be made, but to make this people first language, what you would do is you'd put the person before the disability. It is interesting with disabilities. A lot of times, we describe the disability before we describe the person. Flip it. No dogs allowed except for those, you know, assisting people with visual impairments or hearing impairments, quite honestly, with people who are blind or deaf. And blind or deaf, it's not the most preferable description at this point in our lives, but it, but that idea of just putting the person before the disability. So go take a look at that PDF and then come back in a few minutes. And we're actually, I'm gonna go through one by one all of the different things on, and I didn't invent people first language, you could Google it. Quite honestly, a lot of these examples would be um, in the materials that you would be able to find. But just kind of take a look at it for a minute and see what you think. And then we're gonna come back and I'm gonna go through them. Okay, we're back. 
because you paused me so I can keep going. So here we go. Instead of saying the handicapped or disabled, what you could say, again, is put the person before the disability, people with disabilities. Pretty straightforward, right? But I told you that before you went over there and you could see the second, act, um, second example. You're like, well, Paul's already listed first. Paul apostrophe S means what? It means is, Paul is, right? If you change that to has, it's completely different. Is means um, being, right? B-E-I-N-G, being. Has means possessing. So again, you're not describing somebody's whole experience and a whole life based upon one aspect of their life. So Paul has a cognitive disability or a diagnosis. Kate's autistic. You catching on now? Kate has autism or has a diagnosis of autism. Sarah's learning disabled. You got this one, right? Sarah has a learning disability or a diagnosis. Mary's a dwarf or midget. This one is interesting because the individuals who have been diagnosed with um, short stature, they have no intellectual disabilities whatsoever. If somebody has a cognitive disability, they have their intellect is impacted in some ways, right? In this particular instance, um, this is a community of individuals that have actually advocated for their own language. And this is going to be familiar to individuals, or by individuals, I mean you. If you've ever like paid attention to TLC shows and things over the years, you could say Mary is of short stature or Mary is a little person. That is actually verbiage that has been advocated for by people who have been diagnosed of short stature. Tom's emotionally disturbed or mentally ill has again, right? And that idea of disturbed and ill, they're really negatively charged. So Tom has a mental health condition. Laura's confined to or is wheelchair bound. This is one of my favorite ones. Laura uses a wheelchair. Who the heck cares how much she uses it? She uses a wheelchair. Steve's in special education. This is one I say all of the time because of Sean teaching students receiving special education services. See, Steve receives special education services. He's not a special ed student. He's a student receiving special education services. And special education, I will pause there for a quick second too, because that's even a loaded kind of negative term, right? And quite honestly, it's not necessarily even called special education. Sean is not a teacher, a special education teacher. He's an RSP teacher. And for any of you who have worked as a paraeducator or an aide in a school, you would know RSP and SDC. RSP is Resource, Resource Specialist Program. That's uh, students with mild to moderate disabilities. And then Mac, for instance, was an SD, a student receiving SDC services. So special day class, which is still kind of an antiquated um, description for moderate to severe disabilities. But nobody knows what any of those are. So that's why the term special education kind of persists. Normal, healthy, typical children. How would you say that as people first language? Children without disabilities. You have people with disabilities. You have people without them. You have children with them. You have children without them is nonverbal. This is another one of my very favorites. I actually had a student in two of my classes, um, since I will luckily enough get to, and I do in the fall actually get to teach, instead of two sections of families, I'm teaching uh, families and then a section of gender. But um, Kevin took two different classes with me. And Kevin communicated with his eyes, kind of then communicated via language, uh, I'm sorry, via writing. Kevin communicated by his facial expressions and his laughter. But Kevin did not communicate with words. And quite honestly, Kevin would oftentimes be described as nonverbal. But Kevin was communicating. And quite honestly, he did an amazing job of navigating every single activity we that you did in class. Kevin did with an amazing amount of ability. And so that's the thing. When you take away communication, that's not really fair to individuals because they're communicating via de a device. They're communicating in some way. So I would challenge you, why don't you not speak for the rest of the day and have to communicate with someone, everyone that you need anything from? Can you see how now I played with that word disability at the beginning of the lecture, that idea of individuals who might have a disability have some abilities far beyond all of us. Brain damaged, brain injury. Damage versus injury, again, kind of that negatively charged language. And then finally, a handicapped parking or a hotel room. Accessible. Now it's just accessible to everyone. I want you in the discussion board to talk about which three of um, these people first language aspects that you really want to start using in daily language because it matters. The very, very beginning of the semester, we talked about the three sociological paradigms, right? Symbolic interactionism, that the entire premise of society is that these symbols, the symbols that we share, 
And so with that, here is the last thing we're going to discuss together this semester. And I'm going to try not to get teary-eyed because you know me and I'm such a wuss. But what's this an image for? And if you said handicap, no, go back to the slide before, or I guess rewind me. Um, you're not watching slides like I have in front of me. But rewind, rewind me rather, and uh, that it's about accessibility, right? Now it's just accessible to everyone. But I want you to look at this person. And you can see how very um, lifeless they are in some ways, staring straight ahead, where their arms are, things like that, right? Now imagine if this accessibility symbol was covered by the one I'm about to show you. Because like, quite honestly, the one I'm about to show you is actually done by a guerrilla artist. And a guerrilla artist is an artist who is working to create social change, who is working to change the narrative around inequalities and things. And so this artist tried to get around to as many um, accessibility signs in New York City. Can you imagine how many there are in New York City? And cover the image that you see in front of you with this. Now what do you see? You see somebody using a wheelchair. Like I said, remember that was one of the examples? It's not that somebody's confined to a wheelchair. They're using a wheelchair. And they're using that wheelchair to kick your ass. Wherever they're going, they're getting there before you are. They are alive. They are vibrant. They are capable. And these drawings are both equally simplistic as far as shapes and lines. Symbols matter. So in a world with people first language where sometimes we can be exasperated and say, oh my gosh, does everything like have to be so carefully constructed? I will remind you again, symbols matter. So many of the things that we've learned about this semester have such a great deal of opportunity for you to create change and create a life that you love, right? We've talked so much about families and how you get to shape so much of your life going forward. But the reason I end with disability in this class is because this is an opportunity that we all have for the for Mac, for every person that you have in your life that has any kind of disability, this is a place that we really can create social change for everyone. So I would really, really ask you, quite honestly, if we were taking a final, your last question on the final would be, what are three correct examples of people first language? I would have had you memorize your most favorite three so that hopefully you can start to use them in your you know, opportunities to speak about disability because that is a way to create immense amounts of social change. I'm gonna keep talking for a second because this will be the last time to hear my annoying nasally voice so that I can say thank you. This certainly is a semester that's gonna go down in all of our history books, right? Like nothing we could have seen and who knows what the world has in store for us, but I could not have been in this situation with a better group of students. I'll save more of my weepiness for you know outgoing messages at the very end of class but I just with my voice wanted to say thank you for every effort you made this semester for every astounding aspect of who you all are as individuals I am so darn lucky to have gotten to spend this completely unconventional semester with you